Chapter Twenty Eight of Hans Brinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates by Mary Mapes Dodge. Chapter Twenty Eight. Through the Hague. The picture gallery in the Maritzhuls, a building erected by Prince Morris of Nassau, one of the finest in the world, seemed to have only flashed by the boys during a two-hour visit, so much was there to admire and examine. As for the royal cabinet of curiosities in the same building, they felt that they had but glanced at it, though they were there nearly half a day. It seemed to them that Japan had poured all her treasures within its walls. For a long period Holland, always foremost in commerce, was the only nation allowed to have any intercourse with Japan. One can well forego a journey to that country if he can but visit the museum at The Hague. Room after room is filled with collections from the Hermit Empire, costumes peculiar to various ranks and pursuits, articles of ornament, household utensils, weapons, armor, and surgical instruments. There is also an ingenious Japanese model of the island of Desina, the Dutch factory in Japan. It appears almost as the island itself would if seen through a reversed opera glass, and makes one feel like a gulliver coming unexpectedly upon a Japanese lilliput. There you see hundreds of people in native costumes, standing, kneeling, stooping, reaching, all at work, or pretending to be and their dwellings, even their very furniture, spread out before you plain as day. In another room a huge tortoise-shell dollhouse, fitted up in Dutch style, and inhabited by dignified Dutch dolls, stands ready to tell you at a glance how people live in Holland. Gretel, Hilda, Katrinka, even the proud Ritchie Korbs would have been delighted with this, but Peter and his gallant band passed it by without a glance. The war implements had the honor of detaining them for an hour. Such clubs, such murderous crits, or daggers, such firearms, and above all, such wonderful Japanese swords, quite capable of performing the accredited Japanese feat of cutting a man in two at a single stroke. There were Chinese and other Oriental curiosities in the collection. Native historical relics, too, upon which our young Dutchmen gazed very soberly, though they were secretly proud to show them to Ben. There was a model of the cabin at Saradam, in which Peter the Great lived during his short career as shipbuilder. Also, wallets and bowls, once carried by the beggar confederates, who, uniting under the Prince of Orange, had freed Holland from the tyranny of Spain. The sword of Admiral von Speyk, who about ten years before had perished in voluntarily blowing up his own ship and von Tromp's armor with the marks of bullets upon it. Jacob looked around, hoping to see the broom which the plucky admiral fastened to his masthead, but it was not there. The waistcoat which William III of England wore during the last days of his life possessed great interest for Ben, and one and all gazed with a mixture of reverence and horror-worship at the identical clothing worn by William the Silent when he was murdered at Delft by Balthazar Kiratz. William, Prince of Orange, who became King of England, was a great-grandson of William the Silent, Prince of Orange, who was murdered by Kiratz, or Gerard, July 10, 1584. A tawny leather doublet and plain surcoat of grey cloth, a soft felt hat, and a high neck-ruff from which hung one of the beggar's medals, these were not in themselves very princely objects though the doublet had a tragic interest from its dark stains and bullet-holes. Ben could readily believe, as he looked upon the garments, that the silent prince, true to his greatness of character, had been exceedingly simple in his attire. His aristocratic prejudices were, however, decidedly shocked when Lambert told him of the way in which William's bride first entered the Hague. The beautiful Louisa de Coligny, whose father and former husband both had fallen at the massacre of St. Bartholomew, was coming to be fourth wife to the prince, and of course, said Lombard, 
we hollanders were too gallant to allow the lady to enter the town on foot no sir we sent or rather my ancestors did a clean open post wagon to meet her with a plank across it for her to sit upon <laughs> very gallant indeed exclaimed ben with almost a sneer in his polite laugh and she the daughter of an admiral of france was she upon my word i had nearly forgotten that but you see holland had very plain ways in the good old time in fact we are a very simple frugal people to this day the van ghent establishment is a decided exception you know a very agreeable exception i think said ben certainly certainly but between you and me my dear van ghent though he has wrought his own fortunes can afford to be magnificent and yet be frugal exactly so said ben profoundly at the same time stroking his upper lip and chin which latterly he believed had been showing delightful and unmistakable signs of coming dignities while tramping on foot through the city ben often longed for a good english sidewalk here as in the other towns there was no curb no raised pavement for foot travellers but the streets were clean and even and all vehicles were kept scrupulously within a certain tract strange to say there were nearly as many sleds as wagons to be seen though there was not a particle of snow the sleds went scraping over the bricks or cobblestones some provided with an apparatus in front for sprinkling water to diminish the friction and some rendered less musical by means of a dripping oil rag which the driver occasionally applied to the runners ben was surprised at the noiseless way in which dutch laborers do their work even around the warehouses and docks there was no bustle no shouting from one to another a certain twitch of the pipe or turn of the head or at most a raising of the hand seemed to be all the signal necessary entire loads of cheeses or herrings are pitched from cart or canal boat into the warehouses without a word but the passer-by must take his chance of being pelted for a dutchman seldom looks before or behind him while engaged at work poor jacob poot who seemed destined to bear all the mishaps of the journey was knocked nearly breathless by a great cheese which a fat dutchman was throwing to a fellow laborer but he recovered himself and passed on without evincing the least indignation ben professed great sympathy upon the occasion but jacob insisted that it was naughting then why did you screw your face so when it hit you what for screw mine face repeated jacob soberly why it was de de that what insisted ben maliciously why de 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 what you call this what you taste mit de nose ben laughed oh you mean the smell yes that ish it said jacob eagerly it was de smell i draw mine face for dat ha 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 roared ben that's a good one a dutch boy smell a cheese you can never make me believe that vel it ish no matter replied jacob trudging on beside ben in perfect good humor wait till you hit mit cheese dat ish all soon he added pathetically penchiman i no likes to be called touch dat ish no goot i be a hollander just as ben was apologizing lumbert hailed him hold up ben here is the fish market there is not much to be seen at this season but we can take a look at the storks if you wish ben knew that storks were held in peculiar reverence in holland and that the bird figured upon the arms of the capital he had noticed cartwheels placed upon the roofs of dutch cottages to entice storks to settle upon them he had seen their huge nests too on many a thatched gable roof from brook to the hague but it was winter now the nests were empty no greedy birdlings opened their mouths or rather their heads at the approach of a great white-winged thing with outstretched neck and legs bearing a dangling something for their breakfast the long bills were far away picking up food on african shores and before they would return in the spring ben's visit to the land of dykes would be over therefore he pressed eagerly forward as van monen led the way through the fish market 
anxious to see if storks in Holland were anything like the melancholy specimens he had seen in the zoological gardens of London. It was the same old story. A tamed bird is a sad bird, say what you will. These storks lived in a sort of kennel, chained by the feet like felons, though supposed to be honoured by being kept at the public expense. In summer they were allowed to walk about the market, where the fish stalls were like so many free dining saloons to them. Untasted delicacies in the form of raw fish and butcher's offal lay about their kennels now, but the city guests preferred to stand upon one leg, curving back their long necks and leaning their heads sideways in a blinking reverie. How gladly they would have changed their petted state for the busy life of some hard-working stork mother or father, bringing up a troublesome family on the roof of a rickety old building, where flapping windmills frightened them half to death every time they ventured forth on a frolic. Ben soon made up his mind, and rightly, too, that the Hague, with its fine streets and public parks shaded with elms, was a magnificent city. The prevailing costume was like that of London or Paris, and his British ears were many a time cheered by the music of British words. The shops were different in many respects from those on Oxford Street and the Strand, but they often were illumined by a printed announcement that English was spoken within. Others proclaimed themselves to have London stout for sale, and one actually promised to regale its customers with English roast beef. Over every possible shop door was the never-failing placard, Tabac de Coupe, Tobacco to be Sold. Instead of colored glass globes in the windows, or high jars of leeches, the drug stores held a gaping Turk's head at the entrance, or, if the establishment was particularly fine, a wooden mandarin entire, indulging in a full yawn. Some of these queer faces amused Ben exceedingly. They seemed to have just swallowed a dose of physic, but Van Monen declared he could not see anything funny about them. A druggist showed his sense by putting a gaper before his door, so that his place would be known at once as an apotheque, and that was all there was to it. Another thing attracted Ben, the milkman's carts. These were small affairs, filled with shiny brass kettles, or stone jars, and drawn by dogs. The milkman walked meekly beside his cart, keeping his dog in order, and delivering the milk to customers. Certain fish dealers had dog carts also, and when a herring dog chanced to meet a milk dog, he invariably put on airs and growled as he passed him. Sometimes a milk dog would recognize an acquaintance before another milk cart across the street, and then how the kettles would rattle, especially if they were empty. Each dog would give a bound and, never caring for his master's whistle, insist upon meeting the other halfway. Sometimes they contented themselves with an inquisitive sniff, but generally the smaller dog made an affectionate snap-snap at the larger one's ear, or a friendly tussle was engaged in by way of exercise. Then woe to the milk kettles, and woe to the dogs! The whipping over, each dog, expressing his feelings as best as he could, would trot demurely back to his work. If some of these animals were eccentric in their ways, others were remarkably well behaved. In fact, there was a school for dogs in the city, established expressly for training them. Ben probably saw some of its graduates. Many a time he noticed a span of barkers trotting along the street with all the dignity of horses, obeying the slightest hint of the man walking briskly beside them. Sometimes, when their load was delivered, the dealer would jump in the cart and have a fine drive to his home beyond the gates of the city. And sometimes, I regret to say, a patient fro would trudge beside the cart with a fish basket upon her head and a child in her arms, while her lord enjoyed his drive, carrying no heavier burden than a stumpy clay pipe, the smoke of which mounted lovingly into her face. End of chapter.